Welcome to Comic Book Nation. So much retro <laughs> return to talk today. We have Ghostbusters, Frozen Empire, Roadhouse, X-Men 97 all dropping. Trailer Park is full as Beetlejuice 2, Star Wars, The Acolyte, Alien Romulus, House of the Dragon, and Furiosa, a Mad Max saga all drop new footage that we got to talk about. Plus, we got to still talk about so much geek TV, including Shogun, Invincible, and the season two finale of Halo. And a new Marvel game has made its debut. Welcome to Comic Book Nation, the only show that does it all for geek culture and the official podcast of comicbook.com. I am your host, Kofi Outlaw, and today I got my regular lineup of co-hosts with me. It's Matthew Aguilar. What's up, everybody? Janelle Wheeler. Hello, hello. And Connor Casey. What up? Oh, <laughs> all right. So, you know, I was uh, given the good advice that uh, I can be a bit of a blowhard. So to get to the point and let people know up front what we are doing today. So that's our new intro, guys. I forgot to tell you beforehand. We were arguing <laughs> about rap stuff instead. But, uh, you know, big rap day. But this is not <laughs> rapnation.com. So we'll save that for our next segment. <laughs> um, like I said at the intro, there's so much to talk about today. So let's just get right on into it and i even gave the like a little rundown and forgot our most pressing thing which is a bit of breaking news at the top of the show janelle take us right on into it what's just happening breaking right on here breaking breaking news uh we have a brand new penguin trailer and it's very exciting um i actually was trying to watch it while you guys were talking about rap so that was <laughs> fun um I that, mean, they should kind of go hand in hand. I mean, the yeah. trailer rap, it looks like it could be from a rap album, right? I, like, could, he oh. I could hear some 2 chains over this. Yeah, yeah. Oh I wouldn't be mad at that. Don't sully it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You, you better, you need to chill. But um, all right, seriously, you know, what'd you think? <laughs> yeah, Um. I, I thought it, for what it is, I think it's awesome. I mean, I think it aligns with, you know, the film that we saw him in. Um. It is high crime, uh, violence, dark um you know all of those things that we liked about him in the film and i i just feel like it's i think they're gonna do a great job is it up my alley not really because i like more superhero -y stuff we already know this i like magic and mysticism and you know things like that but it this is exactly what it needs to be in my opinion um and it seems quite disturbing and crime ridden and you know it, it it just dark in general so yeah what do you guys think matt matt you and i are kind of in the midst of reading an entire penguin comic series that we're kind of enjoying that has to do <laughs> yeah. with pretty much tom king you know uh run to the show tom king and it is basically kind of the same story right it's about how penguin really took up that that power vacuum in gotham after carmine falcone's fall and how he kind of got oriented with batman and the iceberg lounge which is what this series is so i mean i like the synchronicity because we're we're loving that series what did you think of this trailer as somebody who you know is deep in kind of this penguin lore right now well i think i mean i I think that's why I was all about this trailer. And I think also to a recent rewatching of the Batman uh, in general, um, some, some people were over and that movie ended up being on and, you know, kind of forgot like how much I dug that movie. Uh, there was, there was a lot of really great stuff in that movie and, and penguin included. Right. And you, you were kind of wanting, I would have wanted even more of his character throughout. So uh, the fact that, you know, we're getting, this is, this is right up my alley i just love all of this like you know street level mafia style crime uh he colin farrell is just i mean I, this dude is doing such an <laughs> otherworldly job with this character uh and i think a lot of it is also informed by just how much i've seen king do uh with with his run right now which if you're not reading that you absolutely should be because it's it's phenomenal uh so i yeah i think it's like a perfect storm all of those things hit for me. I was already excited about this even before King series, but but now I just think, man, I have never been as as hyped for the penguin. I think in my 
entire life. It's probably since, you know, Meredith last had the role, right, Burgess? <laughs> <laughs> like that was like the last time I was this hyped about the penguin. So, uh, you know, good stuff all around. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, it, it's sometimes it's funny how just the simplest approach is the thing like you should be doing. Like the Sopranos with Gotham characters is like what everybody said they would want to see. And this looks like the Sopranos with Gotham characters. So well done. So, I mean, and I love just, I like the way they keep framing the, the marketing, like the, not just action and, and like the comic book ishness, sorry, Janelle, the comic book ishness of it all, but the other side, like just scenes carrying the drama, just like letting us know that we have like prestige actors and, and really talented people who can just sit in a room and have a conversation and really kind of carry this show and, and make us feel like compelled to the kind of mob drama that's going on. And uh, I think this is another kind of teaser that does that. And these are just teasers right now. So it's just yeah. set in tone and the vibe of the show. And uh, yeah, I, I'm kind of like really digging it and kind of just digging what they're showing us and how they're showing it so far. Connor, what do you what do you feel? You'll always come in and give us the real. So uh, how are you feeling about this? I am hyped for this. It, they, they keep showing us so little of what this show actually looks like besides just the tone. And I'm still completely sold on it. I, I want to see, Matt, you talked about you just rewatched the Batman recently. Think about where Gotham is at the end of that show. The mayor is nearly killed. The the city is flooded. And Batman's over here like, maybe I need to rethink my life and how I approach this whole thing. And between now and Batman 2, I want to see a Gotham that still needs someone dressed up in a rubber bat suit, flying around on rooftops, punching criminals in order for that to happen we need someone that's a little bit twisted running the criminal empire and who better than colin farrell hamming it up as as penguin i i i'm i'm entirely sold on this yeah and it already looks like uh kristen miliati who's uh been in you know uh what was that thing last resort that she was just in or that movie with uh, Andy Samberg that was really good. But she's been in a handful of things, How I Met Your Mother. She's the like, mother. Uh, yeah, she's the mother from How I Met Your Mother. But um, she's been steadily just kind of like showing off what she can do. She was in Fargo. Oh, the resort was the Peacock thing. She did the uh, Palm Springs, Wolf of Wall Street. Like she's been in a bunch of stuff. She was uh, DiCaprio's first wife in Wolf of Wall Street. And like, yeah, she's always been talented. And so... I'm really kind of interested to see her as uh, Sophia uh, Marone and just her going at it with Colin Farrell. This just looks like it's going to be fun. You got Clancy Brown as Salvatore Marone, which never go wrong with that. You got Michael Kelly from House of Cards as Johnny Vitti, you know, who's if you've read Batman Year One and all that, you know who these people are. Theo Rossi, Carmen Ajago, like this. This cast is pretty, like I said, this is prestige level kind of casting, and it looks like production. So, yeah, this is going to be an interesting step forward where DCTV, between this and just like Peacemaker, which is on the other side of the spectrum entirely, but both of them, if they're both hits, like I'm still maintaining that DC is kind of getting this TV movie combination thing, you know, together better a little bit, but uh, I just need to speed it up, you know, speed it up. I will say this with Clancy Brown being in there the whole time. I'm going to be like, okay, when are you shaving your head and becoming Lex Luthor? Because to me, <laughs> he is still Lex. He's still the pinnacle. Oh, he's of my favorite performance. Yes. Oh yeah. No, he, I mean, those vocal performances Lex. from Superman, the animated series, like, yeah, it's going to be hard to ever beat that. Just like, you know, Mark Hamill's Joker and Kevin Conroy's Batman. Like they're just some things we can't get over and we don't need to, we don't need to. Speaking of which, that's a perfect segue about us not needing to get over things into our kind of main topic of the day, which is retro return. It just so happened. I was like trying to pull something together with all the monumental amount of content. We had to talk this week about like, what would be a theme of this? And I was like, Oh man. Yeah. And this by today, this week alone, I've had to see a new ghostbusters movie, a roadhouse movie and the return of X-Men, the animated <laughs> series. It's like, well, there's your theme. Boom. So retro returns is what we're talking. Um, Starting with the one I can get out of the way pretty quickly, which is Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. I reviewed this one for comicbook.com, and I gave it three out of five stars. Um, 
I wasn't the biggest fan of Ghostbusters Afterlife. I thought it, while it was very touching and meta, I also thought it was just kind of uneven in tone from the very serious family stuff to the more, you know, irreverent ghost busting stuff, but I got it. And I felt why it was personal for Jason Reitman, who I'm always a fan of from Up in the Air and Juno and a bunch of other movies. And I, I was still willing to say like there was potential in the franchise. Uh, this one is, I, I would say, a step up for me. I would have given Afterlife like a 2.5. I give this one a 3. And I was between a 3 and a 3.5, really. But I didn't want to jump out the window. Um, because this one is much more back to the formula of kind of the original Ghostbusters films. It's in New York City. They have the firehouse, the proton packs, the car. And they're just this new era of Ghostbusters. And it's set within the same universe as those films. So the old guys are still hanging around, you know, Vankman with Bill Murray and, and Ray. Dan Aykroyd and Winston Zedmore, who's now their backer and all that. And so there is this director was one of the co-writers of Afterlife with Jason Reitman. Um, and I'm just trying to figure out his Gil Keenan and he and Reitman are still working on the script for this one. He's just taking the directorial job. But they've got better effects and more time to complete them than we got in like the pandemic era of the last one. And this one remembers kind of what made the first films really good, in my opinion, as someone who grew up in that time period watching those over and over and over again at sleepovers on VHS, which is that Ghostbusters is a kind of a weird comedy movie pastiche built around this idea of, you know, detect scientist detectives, but looking into the paranormal, right? But the movie itself is just like a lot of sequences that often have very weird things happening into them. Like, you know, Ray gets kind of assaulted in bed by a ghost at one point. Like, that's part of that movie. And some of it's really freaky. Some of it's very funny. And some of it's kind of like pushing a PG rating a little bit with some of the things that get said and done in the movies. But um, this movie kind of remembers that and, and tries to recapture that and arguably does it better than, you know, what we've seen from the 2016 one or from Afterlife. And I don't think the 2016 one was a complete failure like other people was. I think it was just too polished and too much of a like a Paul Feig movie with that kind of style of bridesmaid comedy, but that wasn't the vibe of Ghostbusters. That Ghostbusters had a kind of different kind of comedic vibe. This one gets that. It's a lot of like semi on the borderline like adult stuff, some really weird concepts they take swings at in this one that I've teased. Like there's a whole relationship subplot between a human and a ghost in this one which gets kind of really weird at points. And so there's also a very big cast and a lot going on because you have all the people from Afterlife, you have all the original Ghostbusters, and there's all these cross things happening across the generational within you know, the Spangler family from the last film and within the old Ghostbusters from you know the old films of you know, having old man arguments about how much Ghostbusting they should still be doing. On top of that, you got a much scarier villain in this one with Garaka, this ice demon. And, you know, scenes where this thing is freezing people and killing people that are actually pretty freaky. And the demon itself was pretty freaky, which I support. These kids need to be freaked out. They think they know too much these days and they need to be yeah. scared. Like, you got to put a little fear into them, that Amblin love. You know what I'm talking about? So I fully support this. Parents, I don't even think, like, the demon was the most disturbing thing. I think some of the, the ghost-human relationships more disturbing because, you know, not to be spoilers, but, you know, how that those two try to bridge the gap and, and get to each other. It gets a little weird, you know what I mean? And I think that's a little bit more disturbing for like teens or young kids. But the demon is good and kind of scary and it feels like there's stakes. At the end of the day, I feel like this film makes me think that this Spangler family era of Ghostbusters films is something I would continue watching. The cast is just having more fun in this one. They're funnier. Finn Wolfhard's funny. McKenna Grace is becoming like a young star since, you know, She's been acting forever, but uh, Carrie Coon and Paul Rudd are there just to be funny, and the old Ghostbusters are funny. So it's good to be back in this world. It's good to play in it, and this is just kind of an irreverent, fun one with an actual scary villain. So it's more like the original Ghostbusters films than anything I've seen before. So, But it's still a mess, kind of, because the story's a little weird, and it's all over the place. That makes sense to anybody? That makes sense? All right. I've yeah, it makes enough. sense. Mm, you sold me. I want to see it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Okay, I, I, did I my really job, enjoyed but... Afterlife, so I yeah. I'm probably gonna. Oh, you're gonna have a lot of fun with this. Like you're gonna yeah, love yeah. this. 
yeah, when Ember Ember's a little older, you'll have fun kind of sitting down and and watching this with her because there is like there's a lot of daddy, you know, there's a lot of daughter angst in this, and so you'll appreciate it when she's a little bit older, I think. All right, let's move on. I always got to give Matt like a a little a little dad review, side dad review, part of the show. <laughs> in his contract all right let's get to stuff we can all talk about together because my mouth's tired uh, i hate talking i hate hearing myself talk sometimes but uh let's talk about roadhouse so this has been a big question mark right because this movie we were like everybody was like you wait real remake in roadhouse you can't do that and, you know the swayze legacy is heavy you can't touch that stuff without people getting mad um and you know roadhouse is also just like ghostbusters one of those products of the cocaine 80s that is just such a weird movie that you couldn't make it today. Like, you know, Swayze doing this whole kind of like Zen cooler thing. Like all of this was real weird in the testosterone eighties. This was like a real deviation. So he's doing, he's doing spin kicks in tight jeans. Like that's yeah, how you describe like, that movie. It's half ballet, half Zen. Like it's a lot going on in that movie, but you know, we love it because there's nothing else like it. So to remake it is auto automatically an uphill battle. Right. So, uh, you know, you got Connor, you take this one. I said I wasn't going to talk and I'm still talking. Connor, you take this one. <laughs> so, yeah, this is a remake of the classic Roadhouse, uh, this time starring Jake Gyllenhaal. It's set down in Florida and basically he is an ex MMA fighter who has a dark past and you slowly figure out what all uh, happened there. And he basically just gets hired on to be a, uh, a bouncer for a bar that is being overrun by a lot of, uh, a lot of hooligans and at least one guy who has some organized crime affiliation who's trying to tear down the bar in order to build a you know big resort, you know, the usual capitalism thing. So I really enjoyed this. I think it's fun. It pains me to say this being an Irishman, but the worst part of this movie is Conor McGregor. Oh, come on. Here, here's the I thing. I loved it. It's, it's, He's it's so fun. much fun. It's fun. It's it's kind of a modern Western. They they even have one character that keeps pointing that out. And even as it builds and things get a bit more crazy, like it all still feels like a, a somewhat serious movie. And then a cartoon character shows up, burns down an Italian block while butt ass naked and then goes, I'll be on my way. And every time he shows up, it's like, oh, right. I, I can't take any of this seriously because it's just Conor McGregor being Conor McGregor. I mean, you can't take the whole movie series. No, I mean, th th it's it's a dumb, fun movie, but then he <laughs> shows up and it's like, okay, now it's too dumb. And that, that's where uh, it's too fun. Me. Like, honestly, I would have, I would have turned other, it off. If it other than him, him, the least believable so thing is that they're in Florida and it takes 45 minutes for somebody to pull a gun. But <laughs> it's wow. other than him, wow. it's a really good movie. Yeah. Janelle, like, this just feels like shots fired at, at your whole state right it's now. It's fine. He's not, he doesn't understand. He doesn't, he's not from Florida. It's fine. Also, Florida is huge, guys. It's literally like it is the a keys lot of are, are a different thing different than world. Miami. Miami is a different thing than Orlando. You know, Jacksonville is completely different. The panhandle is Alabama. Tampa. Like, <laughs> Yeah, it's it's literally like you're in like 20 different countries when you're in Florida. It's so weird. But um, I will say like I have I did not know this was a remake. I was like, why am I watching this? I started it and I was like, oh, my God. This is... And then I was like, oh, it's in the Keys. OK, cool. I'll watch it because it's in Florida. Um, and, you know, I recognized a lot of the scenes and that was really cool. I I in the original is it like is the story like verbatim is this is he a, a fighter Roughly, yeah it, it was it always in florida like no it was no it was like out in the desert in the first okay one. yeah yeah okay well i loved i loved the ocean stuff i mean i loved like the boat stuff i loved the crocodile stuff even though i had to google i was like wait a minute we don't have crocodiles in florida we have gators but we do have crocodiles apparently in south 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 florida um and the originals in uh missouri jasper missouri okay okay yeah but i loved the mcgregor like i well also shout out the post malone is in this fighting which is hilarious like it's while it's post literally... malone music is playing I mean, that's where you had almost lost yeah. me in the beginning <laughs> yeah me too me too i was like Wait, you've got I'm his own character <laughs> poster then bails the moment dylan hall shows up i'm like what the hell <laughs> But it's fun. It's something to turn on. The action and the fighting, I think, is spectacular. Like, the fighting is just really awesome to watch. Um, but, like, 
you get hit that many times in the face from like someone that strong, like you die on the third hit. Like you can't take that many blows. Like it's obviously not, you know, this one guy flies off a boat onto a roof that that dude would be dead, but somehow he's, he's still alive. Like you just have to, you know, use your imagination a little bit and just kind of have fun with the fact that this is just a high fight, like action, violent movie. And it, I, again, I probably would have turned it off if it weren't for McGregor because I was getting a real bored. Um, yeah, with just the story. I was like, I get it. Okay, so he's trying to defend. Like, uh, give yeah, me something then, else. To then he gets mad and basically to. goes full rampage. And he's like, I just broke your trachea. You can't breathe. And I'm pushing you <laughs> into a pool. It's like, oh, he's a serial killer. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, the wait, wait, wait. Let's just set context here because that is an Easter egg. The original film, the premise is that Swayze's character Dalton is like the best bouncer in New York City, which during the 80s was like a oh. war zone in the 70s and 80s. Okay. But one night he got in a fight with a man and he ripped his throat out. That's where like throat ripping comes. If you've ever seen that in comedy <sighs> movies and stuff, mm -hmm. he ripped his throat out. And so he has to relocate to Missouri and like where he's haunted by his own violence. And then he gets hired to be what's called a cooler, which is to basically just settle things down at this kind of country ass roadhouse. And then it's the same kind of premise. The gangsters want it. He's like, nah. And eventually he has another fight where, believe it or not, he rips a guy's throat out at the end, you know? Like, and so it's just, it was like, that was kind of a thing about it is like, he's like this cool, like That's chill guy, insane. but like, oh no, I think he doesn't at the end. He doesn't rip the he guy's throat out. Which is like, kill. Yes, his big growth is he doesn't rip the guy's throat out again um and so he has a magneto you know, arc. yeah exactly yeah very much so like <laughs> he then is just like i'm better now so there, that is an easter egg but it was this kind of weird jump where he's like you know trying to bruce banner it most of the time and but he's just like this guy who can really like just beat people to a pulp if he really wanted to which is what this movie is kind of aping um but i agree that it like i disagree with everybody who was like you should have put this in theaters like guys from now on, let's just all chill until we see a movie to really make that assessment. Just because there's a really good trailer doesn't mean it should be in movies. The sound design on this is horrible. It should never have been in theaters. There are so many like redubbed lines and ADR lines that I'm listening to them with these noise canceling headphones because I like to really kind of get the sound stuff. And it is, it's not a great sound design in this. And some of these scenes are really kind of not staged well. But uh, like you said, the action and kind of just the overtop hilarity of it is kind of the charm. Um, the one serious drama part I thought was really good in this one was when we got uh, what's his name? Billy. Uh, I always butcher his last name. Uh, Billy Magnuson. Bag Billy Magnuson. Um, the guy who plays the uh, the criminal son, you know, that guy when he goes to the bar and he's like. And you find out, you know, Jillian Hall character, Hall's characters, or why am I calling his character? Dalton's origin story, uh, and that part. And there were little moments of drama like that, which is really good. Uh, that, that Dylan, Daniela. Like, right. When that happened, I was like, all right, Doug Lyman made this. And that guy's got some bangers yeah. to his name. So it's like, all right, a real director made this movie. Yeah, exactly. And there are moments like that where you're like, oh, yeah, this is this is really good. And Daniela Ma uh, Melanquire from Su the Suicide Squad it continues. Although how she ended up in Florida and with that accent and, and all that, just don't ask. But um, yeah, she's still proven to be like a really great, you know, actress. And there's a lot of people who show up in this that you recognize from, like you said, Post Malone to Connor McGregor to uh, Hakeem D. Alameda from, or J.D. Pardo from, you know, Mayans and stuff who was the the guy who he first, the first bully he beats out. So it's a fun movie, but I think they did it right. Like, I think just streaming it on prime and letting people enjoy it as a big prime release was smart. And to kind of go that way. Matt, I feel like, feel? Oh, oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead, Connor. I was going to say last thing on this. I feel like this should be one of those TNT mainstays where it's just a random Saturday and they just take a two hour chunk and put this on and it's just there forever. Yeah, it, exactly. It, it, that's the perfect slot yeah. for it. Yeah, cable B movie is, and that's no shade. I mean, some of the movies I still watch the most are like U.S. Marshals because they oh, were I pumped love into U.S. Me. Marshals. See, exactly right. Like they pumped <laughs> it into you through cable so many times that, like, yeah, you want to see Wesley Snipes take that jump with the cast and do all that stuff. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, man. Like I get it, and I agree wholeheartedly with Connor. Like, yeah, put this on cable. 
have it on a Saturday and I'll just be like, oh, that roadhouse. And it'll become, you know what? That might be the best thing for it because in that way, it'll become just like the first roadhouse, which is how most of us know that movie anyway, from just random either references in comedy movies or ju- or other things or just cashing it in t- on cable and being like, oh, that is that crazy sin- <laughs> Swayze movie and watching me like, really? What is this? <laughs> like, Come yeah, to think of it, that is how that. I saw the original. Exactly. I, I was yeah, on cable man. one day. Yeah. And then I, I think I came in like halfway and then yep. I went back and watched the whole thing. You got I was like, to. Okay, I got to know how yeah, this starts. You got to know how to, exactly. I got to. <laughs> and then you get some throat ripping in the very beginning. You're like, whoa, this is a very different movie than I thought it was. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oof. I'm getting a little too hyped uh, over some Roadhouse here. But uh, yeah, I'm not going to lie. So you kind of got me because I haven't had a chance to see it yet. Uh, but I I think I actually I think you got me more hyped to, to watch this movie because I look, I, I go in with when we first saw the trailer, I went in with like, oh, this is going to be stupid fun. I'm in for it. I like when you're remaking or reviving or however they kind of phrase this right. Roadhouse. I feel like you kind of know what you're you're going into. So, you know, I it sounds exactly like I thought it would. So I will I and this is the perfect streaming direct release. I think this yeah. is perfect. So yeah, one of these uh days coming up here, I'll just pop this on and I'll be I'll be happy, I'm sure. All right. So that is Roadhouse, and it is now streaming on Amazon Prime Video. Uh, last up for our retro returns is X-Men 97. Yes. Um, <laughs> oh boy. um, and I'll be honest, I, I'm going to get mine out of the way real quick. I, I was ready to come on here and really go off on X-Men 97. Um, I rewatched the old series, which was not a pleasant rewatch for me. I was like, oh man. There's a lot of this that's kind of rough. And I saw the first episode and I was really just, I mean, I got mad. There's like a bling reference. That's 99, bro. And there's like a rave scene. And I was like, we were not raving like that in the late 90s. Come on now. Like, I remember this. But I got to say, by the end of the second episode, I'm back in. They got me. I'm back in. Um, You know, you get an episode where it's just like Trial of Magneto, The Executioner, and that storm depowered storyline all in one like it it reminded me of what i loved about the original which was the first time getting to see a lot of the craziest x-men comic concepts actually thrown up on screen even if that was in some rough animated form and this one has a little bit tighter animation but uh yeah and we're already segueing into things like inferno like it's pretty nuts and it's just that cheesy X-Men comic goodness that I can't help but love by the end, but even if I don't love all the voices, but we'll get into that. Uh, Janelle, <laughs> as somebody who's always... Janelle, you're always only can be on the fence about animation, so how did you feel yeah. about us making you watch? And X-Men. Oof, this yep. I didn't realize how much of this potential... Double whammy. Was for you. Yeah. I, like, I like my throwback X-Men because I know these characters. Like, I'm familiar with them, so it's not intimidating. Like, I didn't live under a rock in 97. <laughs> you know, I was like, I was a kid. I was around it. I was exposed. Um, and, yeah, it just felt very reminiscent of what I remember from the show. I didn't go back and rewatch um, at all. So I, I couldn't remember storyline. I didn't, like, even remember every character and their, you know, capabilities and personality and things like that. Um, but I feel like they did a really good job of kind of just explaining it all and getting you linked in, even if you don't have that extensive knowledge of these characters in the background. So I, I appreciated like, maybe it might've been boring for, for some of our expert friends, but I appreciated the first episode that they kind of made it very crystal clear. Like, this is what's happened to professor. Like this is, our villain, this is, you know, the, the kind of, um, strain between humans and mutants. This is everybody's power sets. Like these are the relationships. Like I got all of that in the first episode. I think that was really important, especially for anyone new who might be tuning in for the first time. Um, and then of course it was, it's beautiful. It looks like a comic book, which I love. I, I miss that. And, um, you know, I've really enjoyed it with invincible and I really enjoy it here too. Yeah. Yeah. That's a that's a good TL. Okay, so um 
the and Kofi mentioned earlier, right? I get dad reviews, right? Well, uh, <laughs> there's not a more fitting one for this because uh, my Munchkin saw me starting to watch this on my laptop and went, "Oh, what's that?" And I was like, "Oh, this is like X Men." And she was like, "I won't watch." So she sat in my lap, right, and we watched both episodes back to back. She was enthralled the entire time she had to go get a juice and she asked me to pause right so that's how you know like i don't want to miss anything uh that was the like i think the best possible way i could have i could have watched this because she would ask me questions like who's that and like oh okay and you explain stuff and you go back to oh and this is what happens and it was like a perfect bridge to when i was a kid and this was out and it was my this was my end all be all x-men the animated series was my i you know i adore batman uh, and Batman the Animated Series um, is an all-time classic. But X-Men the Animated Series probably holds the higher place in my heart because it's just, I love X-Men. Um, and so for this, you know, there's things that, like, my my now brain would pick up on that, like, would take me out of it momentarily. Stealing like, some of the, like, there's pieces brain. of dialogue, you know, that, like, don't click with me um, now. And I'm like, oh, that sounds, like, really, like, <laughs> why does that stick out so much? And And then there was, like uh little choices um like certain voices you know are authentic because it's like the original cast but like they don't click for me as much now and i and it's like so like there's things about like the i guess modern critic ear uh that have grown up around all this stuff that like would momentarily take me out of things and then i will go okay but number one like that is a voice from the original like that's how it sounded and then i would also take things of like but that's also how the dialogue was then so it's like if i take my it's like there's parts of it that like if i turn my critic brain off for for a minute and go but this is actually the style that they are picking up on like it's authentic to the experience you know what i mean so like i have little nitpicks but i gotta say like by the end of the first episode um you know i was i was in and then episode two i'm glad they they released this in a batch because like two is where my god like that episode just rules uh a across the board and i thought they you know they did a really good job um i of capturing that feeling um i i will say they did my boy right uh cyclops is like my favorite x-man uh and Dude, that boy, thing when he drops out of the sky and lands using his optic blast the first the first oh, slid battle out of my, scene. Oh, that Vince McMahon me? Oh, I can't even use that anymore. The, the yeah. first nope. <laughs> the, the nope. first battle scene where he's using his optic blast in like four different ways. He move he uses it to move him across the the floor quicker. He like he hits another guy with an accurate beam, then he hits a wide one, then he like uses it to move him like a dash. Like the the way they interpreted the powers here i mean obviously we've seen like the gambit wolverine bits and things like that too but like uh i mean everything from i'm obviously getting into spoiler territory here but like rogue uses her powers in a great way in episode two and it's like in the moment makes perfect sense and it's it's again it's always showcasing like the versatility of their abilities uh there was also a gold yeah. balls reference which i adored yeah. so like they did a good job I, I thought they captured the feeling uh i have nitpicks and and stuff but like honestly i'm i'm in i want to see the rest of the season and uh, there was really no gonna be no doubt about that but now i'm like it's it's 100 yeah, percent. i just realized it's... my friend is in this trailer oh. <laughs> cosplaying what? yes like my oh, mom's in friend. that one yes in that She's scene jubilee. that's awesome She's Oh my God, that's crazy. That's uh, crazy. Um, I, I just want to say we had on repeat. No, I just want to say um, from Matt's point, like one thing I do like is it's clear, like some of the things that we've talked about, because, you know, we started this with the Krakoa era of the comics is they really are. I feel like one thing Jonathan Hickman really has cemented into X-Men lore from here on out is mutants using their powers and circuits because there was a lot of that in these episodes from like Magneto and Storm combining theirs to just you know doing that but then i realized like also <laughs> x-men the animated series was one of the first places we really got that in that last episode because the whole thing is like xavier and magneto combine their powers to you know say anyway but i liked that we had that because that was really cool and like that really is kind of a key difference for mutants is like and so like yeah the gambit claw wolverine like that was amazing <laughs> and it looked even better when he just takes that you know when that thing whole playing thing plays out but um i'm liking that the x-men like you said, they they feel like they they live in these powers. They feel like they work as a unit, and and all of that is is really well done. So, digging it as well. Uh, Connor, how'd you feel? 
man, I was ready to come on here and tear this show apart after that first episode because the the animation outside of the action scenes, I was comparing it to Flash animation from the mid-2000s or the motion comic preview trailer we had last week for the three X-Men lines that are about to come out. Um, we've already talked about the voice acting. Uh, them fighting robots, to me, has never been interesting. The Sentinels are only interesting when the, when the mutants are on the back foot, not when they have the advantage. Then episode two hits, and it hit me like a truck, where I go, oh, this really works. To where you have Magneto in, in my personal opinion, his most interesting position, which is ex-villain trying to be better as a hero for Charles. To me, that has always been Magneto at his most interesting. The animation starts looking better. The voices, yes, you can tell the age on some of the actors, but it starts to click. Everything with Storm and getting depowered. The very obvious January 6th parallels. Um, the speeches from Storm, from Magneto, he gets like three back to back to back, and you're like, oh, no, this is really working. So by the end of ep if if you just watch episode one, you might be like, eh, th this, this feels like a relic. Episode two, you go, oh, no, wait, they have something to say, and it is fantastic. So I am completely sold on this show, and that's coming from the negative guy on this podcast. Come on, y'all. Yeah, I mean, there you go. I mean, yeah, I think it is, as Matt said, it was, like, really smart to release both episodes first because, as Janelle said, I think Janelle pointed out from her perspective that was very necessary, just getting reimmersed in this world, who's who, what's what, what's going on, and then, yeah, episode two really proving that, like, because my whole thing is, you know, with these retro kind of shows and comics and, you know, from the Batmans to the X-Men's to everything else is do you have something actually new to say and, and modern to say in the skin of this retro thing? And episode two really proves that X-Men 97 does. Like Connor said, it, it has a lot to say about things that are clearly about right now. Like, yeah, when when they all start running, I'm like, oh, OK, like I see where we're going with this. But um, just the, the layers of that Magneto thing for right now about, you know, my people have been through stuff, but I'm trying to chill. But if you can't chill, I can't chill. And like, you know, all this thing is like there's so many geopolitics in this episode that I was like, man, this is an X-Men cartoon. Like, yeah, we well done. So I'm interested to see because it feels like it'll balance X-Men for, for what it always is, which is obvious, really deep social, racial commentary and cultural commentary, plus some of the most outlandish comic book stuff that we've ever seen. And by the end of that very serious episode, we have a soap opera twin drama that's on our laps, right? So, like... And one of the one of my favorite lines from the second episode is Gene shouting, he's coming, and Wolverine's like, who, Apocalypse? <laughs> the baby! Yeah, yeah oh, like, that is right. hilarious, dude. And there's a comedy in this, yeah, and then she, like... He's so, and I just love it that he's like such a slow man about it that she just psychically like throws his wallet and keys in his hand to be like, let's go. <laughs> like, get me to the hospital. Yeah. There's a lot of fun. I mean, there were funny parts in this. So like, yeah, it's interesting. And there's a whole world to this already. And uh, I wanted to not like X-Men 97 this much, but here we are. All right. Anybody got any parting things before we take a break here? I want Rogue's power just to be able to touch a doctor and be like, and now I have a PhD. I want Rogue's power to touch her own throat and change her voice, but that's me. Yeah, All right. Yeah, yeah. I will uh, say it was nice to... seeing uh, Bishop is a great addition to like the full scale lineup, you know, because like obviously he was featured in the original show, but like being having him like be a full time a part of the team, like they used his powers in really cool ways. Also, uh, Ember is now a Jubilee fan. That makes me extremely happy. <laughs> all right there you go matt's happy let's take a break when we come back for the second half of comic book nation we still have a bunch to talk about we have so many trailers to go through and talk about plus what's happening on tv shogun halo invincible stay tuned for all of it
Welcome back to Comic Book Nation, the only show that does it all for geek culture and the official podcast of comicbook.com. We had a pretty full first half where we talked about the Penguin trailer and reviewed Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, the new Roadhouse, and X-Men 97. We got to keep on rolling because the trailer park is looking full today. Starting off with something a little bit fun that we decided to hand off to Janelle Wheeler. Yeah. Uh, guys, Beetlejuice dropped. I'm so excited. However, I feel like this trailer did not give us much. <laughs> like, I have no idea what the story is going to be about. We don't get a good look at Beetlejuice. But we do understand that the area is all reminiscent of the first film. So we have where the car accident happened, the little bridge. We have a funeral. I don't know who for. <laughs> and it looks like Lydia comes face to face with Beetlejuice um, at the end of, of this trailer. So, you know, I would have liked a not Lydia. Wait. Oh, I thought it was Lydia. Oh, no. Oh, it's the daughter, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, there's no, yeah, we know some story. Lydia. We know some story elements. There's a synopsis that came with it. So we can right. we have but if you're just watching the trailer, you don't get a lot of information, but you get a lot of nostalgia, which is great. And I feel like that's what we want. His hair doesn't look right though to me. That's my one criticism. <laughs> Beetlejuice's hair looks different. And his voice sounds a little different too. So I'm gonna be a little critical. This is one of my favorite films. I, I adore Beetlejuice. So, um, you know, my expectations are pretty high and I am cautiously optimistic. How are you guys feeling about it all? I, I, I think, think oh, oh, I think that I'm just going to say one thing. Um, I, I, The Beetlejuice look thing, I think, is this is one area where I think a long sequel actually works for a character like this because, you know, no, no offense to Michael Keaton, who still looks great, but like him being older and looking older just makes his character look like, wilder and more decrepit in a way which i think works for beetlejuice so i was kind of like okay with that part i was just like oh i was like yeah i'm down with that and that part i wasn't i wasn't mad at i think that um there's some interesting things i think this is a good teaser for me because it's just to kind of let the world know because you got to remember we are in deep in a nerd bubble in a geek bubble and like we've been on this the whole way but like the larger mainstream world is just finding out that it's just been like i've had a lot of messages like hey you know this beetlejuice 2 thing is happening how crazy <laughs> is that i'm like crazy time until it releases yeah. so yeah exactly and so this is like a first early teaser but it's just pulling out the big guns right we got michael keaton we got uh winona ryder back we got Catherine o'hara back and oh for you gen zers it's your girl jenna ortega is in, up in this so you know like they're just hitting those beats. And um, we know that this is going to be about a death in the family. Uh, I, I keep trying to make out who's on that tombstone, but it's most likely the Lydia. I would bet either Lydia's stepfather, Charles, or if she was married to somebody or, or with somebody, that person died Astrid's father, which is why she's all messed up. So I think it's kind of be And Tim Burton has said for me, I like this because I think this is good for like, us who grew up with Beetlejuice because Lydia is now middle age. She was like the goth kind of counter rebellious daughter in the first one, but obviously time changes and becoming a parent changes you. And when you have, I, I this speaks to me directly because I am in that place where like, I have my kids yell at me. I have my parents yell at me on the other side. And I'm just like, what is life? Um, <laughs> this is what it means to be middle age. Uh, and so I could see this being fun from the Lydia perspective of, of that, of trying to now deal with your own kid that you made when you were a weirdo, plus your crazy stepmom that have made you weird in the first place and them working stuff out as like three generations of, of these deets women is going to be interesting to me. Um, and then of course, like what Beetlejuice has been up to, we know he has a wife because Monica Bellucci from the matrix is playing his wife and what that all is about and like what, how the spirit world, you know, factors in and how it speaks to kids who are dealing with stuff today, I think is going to be all interesting to me. So I'm I'm kind of I'm in. I mean, but I was never gonna have any hate for this. I was I was arguing with a friend who was like, Tim Burton ain't done nothing like in years. And I was like, Well, he did direct those four episodes of Wednesday and come up with that show, which made me a believer again. But like, yeah, he's got something to prove on the movie direction front. But I think uh I'm I'm optimistic about this one so far. 
No, I think it looks solid. And like, like you said, Kofi, I think it's this feels like the right time to put out one of these to where we can get multiple generations. Uh, and it's not just all callbacks to what happened with the original. And Keaton looks great. And I do think him actually aging makes the character make a bit more sense. My one thing, and it has nothing to do with the movie. It is entirely everything to do with the trailer. I know for years now, we love doing the slowed down dramatic version of songs as the backdrop for trailers. Of all the songs to do, <laughs> Fonte's Banana Boats doesn't really work. Yeah, that's a that's a hard one to keep uh, bringing back. And it, I was actually getting into this conversation with somebody also. Yeah, it's not helping Tim Burton's case in certain ways, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, it's so iconic with the first film that like I, get it. it's the original I don't think when they're like daylight. Yeah, come. It's yeah like, I think and I think all children cannot be singing think, this right now like this, please. Yeah, it is. It's weird. It's a weird one. Um, when you it's one of those things you don't want to think too much about. But uh, then again, this is like uh, this is that weird Nickelodeon doc week. So, yeah, you got to think about these things a little bit more, maybe. But yeah, it is a weird choice. But I think most people think it's daylight come or something like that instead of. Yes, a song by Ari Belafonte called Banana Boat, which is all about, uh, yeah, Cuban farmers having to basically indentured servant themselves to harvest bananas and yeah. while the master's yelling at them and so they can make their quota for the day. So it's a kind of a slave song. Yeah, it's a little problematic. But hey, wasn't it catchy in that first one? Wasn't it though? All right. Uh, I mean, it wasn't just catchy. It was like the defining scene of the whole. Yeah. Film. Yes, it is. And it, I mean, and it still so is. And this is it's, yeah. It's hard. Life it's is a weird. Hard place. Yeah. It is. Life is weird. That chose that though. I will agree. Yeah. It, it's like woof. You guys are just taking the swing with that one. And yeah, a whole children's chorus too. Okay. We're doing that. All right. But um, yeah, I, I did like the footage, and I think like just everything I see from the construction of it, I, I thought was good. Matt, did we didn't get to you, Maddie? Did we? No, but I mean, I think you, I think you guys said it really well. I mean, I, I'm, I kind of agree that like with Janelle on the fact that like this was, I understand why it's needed. So like I know like certain teasers and trailers aren't necessarily always built for me, right? And so I'm totally fine with that. But I will say for what I was looking for, it was a little too short. Uh, and there wasn't enough on this for me to like get super hyped. I've never been like the biggest Beetlejuice person either. Like, <laughs> I, I enjoy it, but it's not like my like all time classic, but I really love Wednesday. <laughs> so, uh, and I, and I like Tim Burton, a lot of other Tim Burton projects. So, um, I'm in for this. I just, I, I am looking forward to seeing like a full trailer for it to get a better sense of like, if I will be jumping back in so soon. So. That's How can me. you be smirch beetle guys? <laughs> My God. <laughs> All right. Let's keep it moving on to something a little more creepy. And uh, the one that really kind of stuck out for me this week, uh, Alien Romulus. So we have a new Alien movie coming, Alien Romulus. And it's being done by Fede Alvarez, who, as this trailer tells you, is the man who did the Walking, or walking Dead, Jesus, Evil, Evil Dead, Dead remake of the 2010s and don't breathe uh which if you haven't seen don't breathe excellent horror film go go check that out so when i heard that fede alvarez's next project because he's been notorious i mean this guy is like quentin tarantino of horror films right like he's just always like eh, i don't know he produces a lot of things but he's just like when it comes to him actually wanting to get behind a camera and make something like it's usually pretty special when he jumps in so i was hyped when i heard he was doing this and this first trailer is the kind of teaser that I like. It is basically a teaser that tells us that we're going back to basics with this alien movie and we're getting back to what made the first one really stand out, which was tight claustrophobic quarters and body horror. And, you know, body horror from a, you know, a very kind of reproductive body horror, which is the essence of this entire franchise. Um, and when it's the best scenes you remember are all about that. And it just looks like they are condensing and filtering that down into another movie like this with even more of a threat than the first alien movie had. This ship looks like it is overrun with face grabbers already, which quickly can turn a very populated ship into a very big death trap. And I am here for it. And if it's that simple, 
it, it I, I am here for it. And even Aliens, which seems to trick you by making it seem like it's bigger in scope, is actually in some ways even more claustrophobic because it's them stuck under that reactor or them stuck in that base and that's pretty or stuck on the ship at the end. So it's just three kind of choke points that they're stuck in throughout the movie. Um, and I love that about that's what I love best about Alien. We've been reading Alien comics and stuff on here. I don't this franchise never dies for me because there's so many permutations you can do with it and so many ways you can make it a good horror kind of series. So uh, this was an effective teaser with me and the fact that it's going to be younger people. It looks like taking this on is uh, like I said, these kids need to get some hair on there. Or wait, that sounds weird. They need to get some metal in their backs. So like, this is going to be interesting for me. I don't know, like some metal in their spine. I don't know to get tougher. This is what I'm trying to say, Connor. I'm trying to say, because you're making faces for the non-video people. Is hair on your chest. That, 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 yeah, that I, that's totally why I stopped. But I did. that sounds weird for kids, so I stopped. Like, oh, man. So, yes, they need some courage. Let's just keep it a basic language. These kids need some courage, and them facing the monsters in the dark is a good kind of lesson, I feel like. Janelle, you can hate horror sometimes. I always like to get you as a kind of a, a test, as a control to my madness. So what did you think of this teaser? <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I really love sci-fi. I love space. I love aliens and all of that fun stuff. So this feels interesting to me. Um, and I, I don't feel as horror like vibes as I mean, I obviously it's bloody and it honestly was making me think of the latest Halo episode when I was watching this. Um, but <laughs> But I, I'm I'm quite interested in it because of the space aspect, really, like that that speaks to me. So I'm more excited about this than I would be, say, like a ghost or, you know, some weird supernatural thing. Um, I'm more into the alien stuff. So, yeah, I could definitely get into this. I, I I'm definitely going to watch it for sure. Maddie, how do you feel? Because I know this is not your cup of tea. Well, so here's, you know, it's funny, uh, Janelle brings up Halo, and I feel like that was my, uh, like, I have a ceiling of how many creepy, crawly things I can deal with, uh, and that was, like, that was my ceiling. But then Halo so this... was also, like, oh. The Last of Us, we're <laughs> like, what is going on, <laughs> like? <laughs> so I was like, okay, I got, I got this, and, like, yeah no uh this is you know for again no no disparagement to the quality of the movie or the trailer it did its job i'm freaked out and i don't want to be in this place uh that they are in so you know it it sold me i get it i will probably you know i i will watch this and i will watch it with like one eye closed uh just so that i can Yo, <laughs> Fede's movies over. are. I, I'm gonna tell you, Ugh. no matter how like Fed, um, I love them, but Fede's movies are never easy rewatches. I can tell you that. Nope. Connor, uh, did you already comment on this one, or do we need your I, take? I, I haven't. And so my thing about the Xenomorphs is that they stopped being scary when we started throwing Space Marines at them. So it's been decades of this, and we've had multiple Alien installments. We've had the Alien versus Predator duology. We've had. Prometheus and whatever the hell that last alien movie was supposed to be. And my thing has always been with them. It's at this point, we're decades into this. We've learned so much about these creatures that the fear of the unknown that was in the original was long since gone. But like you said, Fede Alvarez movies are hard watches. They are intense, especially that evil dead from about a decade ago. I think if anybody is going to make me be afraid of these little bastards again, it's this guy. So this, uh, this trailer sold me. Yeah. And uh, in the comments, Eddie Ray, uh, Raymond, um, we know from production, they're using like a combination of CGI and practical, like they have actual face grabbers and practical effects and, and, and puppetry and stuff. They're going back to some of that too. So Ooh, one, um, one note about this, cause Fetty's done some interviews already. Apparently, he showed it to James Cameron and Ridley Scott, the directors of the first two. They both liked it, but they both had different notes on it, which tells me maybe he found a happy medium between Alien and Aliens. Yeah, that's a good sign. I would take that as a good sign. If they have different notes and it's not like the same complaint, like, yeah. One's going to be like, needs more Marines. One's going to be like, needs less guns. Needs <laughs> like, to be scarier and have Michael Fassbender <laughs> playing with flutes. 
Yeah. Mm. All right. But uh, yeah, no, I mean, I'm in for this. I, I can't wait till this comes out. Uh, I'm going to be, I'm happy to see Alien back on the big screen. Matt, take us into the black. Yeah, so uh, for for those who have been following the show for a minute, uh, everyone knows my glaring blind spot uh, is is Game of Thrones. Uh, I was very much just like missed the boat completely. Uh, and so House of the Dragon season one was my entryway into the franchise in a, in a lot of ways. Uh, and it did the trick. I mean, simple premise. Uh, I was engaged with with all the personalities and characters. So I am... I was very much excited for season two, and man, this trailer did not dull that at all. I am, I am hyped, and I feel, I feel like in a lot of ways the premise is almost simpler this time around. In the fact that it's just like it's a battle for you know being the rightful heir, right? It, it that's that's what this is. It's a war between two sides, one the rightful heir and one not. But I just think I, I will also say, and I'll I'll leave the praise that I feel like is coming from Janelle. Uh, for a certain person in this trailer to her uh, because I know she adores him. But I will say uh, there was like one person that like almost stole the entire trailer for me every time <laughs> he was on screen. Um, I, I was I was hyped for this. This this did the trick for me. Okay, Janelle, you want to take that baton and run with it? Dude, I miss bleaching my hair. I need to <laughs> get my hair done again. I am just, I love the Targaryen crew. I love them so much. Uh, this, I i really was kind of nervous about like the gap and how much time they were taking. And if I'd kind of lose interest because I, I did kind of run out of steam on Game of Thrones. I really did. Um, but these trailers blew me away, both of them, and got me even more excited to the point where I'm, Googling like, oh, yeah, who plays this? Like, where did we leave off there? Or, you know, just trying to remember everything because there was a shift in actors with like time jump in the first season. I'm kind of having this moment of like, wait a minute, who is that again? Whose son is that? Who's but obviously I remember the very impactful moments of like the death of one of the kids and like <laughs> obviously, you know, our main characters. But yes, I'm obsessed with Matt Smith. He is such a rock star and uh, he's like the best. The amount of Doctor Who that is in the show is so exciting. I found out that Ty Tennant, who is the son of David Tennant, my favorite doctor, is one of these kids in it. And I I didn't know that the whole first season. So yep. now I'm like, please, please, let, like, let's bring this back because I I just I'm obsessed. I'm so excited about all of it. I I, I hope you guys can feel the energy. I'm just I'm thrilled. I'm so excited for this to come back. Yeah, um, these were interesting, and I love the marketing that they did for this. If you know yeah. your Game of Thrones history, I was a big Game of Thrones nerd. Um, yeah, their House Targaryen kind of split into these two factions of the Greens and the Blacks. Uh, High Towers, uh, Alison High Tower, and her family kind of led the Greens as putting Aegon, her son, on the throne after Viserys died, while uh, Princess Rhaenyra and her faction were the Blacks in the greens and the blacks this is the dance of dragons that we've heard so much about and so yeah i love these two trailers kind of giving you both halves of the story and showing you because they are physically separated and just showing you the arcs of both sides throughout the season i thought that was a very clever kind of marketing way of doing it not overwhelming you but like kind of in you know even making it a friendly kind of competition to see which one gets more views or more comments or interaction and all that stuff and see which side is loved or which side is hated and like yeah that's that's all good stuff and like matt said it's a it's probably the most simple game of thrones seasonal premise we're ever going to get yeah. like this is as simple as it gets you took a throne you're not right we're coming for the throne leah i'll see you in hell try to take it like you know Boom, let's go. So I love that we don't have to do like crazy long preamble to all of this, that we can just get into it. And this is why I, I'm kind of liking the idea of more of these Game of Thrones spinoffs if they are shorter seasons, because I don't see this one going past four seasons, like tops, they, tops they, four they seasons. They honestly could end it after three. Yeah, and I, and I hope they do. And I hope then we get the story of Aegon the Conqueror, which they're already working on. And like, we can keep this real quality high, like just get to the main stories, have the political intrigue and everything we love, but just get to the main stuff a lot quicker. We're not waiting eight seasons for zombies. And like, we're just get to it and tell these good stories. And there's a bunch of them we can keep telling, you know? And so I hope 
we continue to flow. I like seeing the cast and the aged up cast kind of hopefully settling in even better. And if you know this story and some of the stuff that happens, like, yeah, there's already teases of it and I'm hyped and yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be exciting. And I'm ready to get our fake English accents back on and house of the dragon and get out here and, and start doing our thing again. Um, Connor, you have anything to say before we move on? I, I loved the idea of splitting these trailers into two because it shows different sides of like there's a like brother on brother twin fight, there's going to be dragon fights. So you almost see the shot versus shot comparison of like, okay, which dragon is fighting who? Um, w- Matt, you, you said it already that this, this is going to be a much simpler season than last time. There is no big time skip. There's no big confusion about what actor you're supposed to be playing. Who is a simple war story now. So you're getting a lot of dragon fights, a lot of people dying, a lot of bodies dropping, a lot of war crimes. Uh, we get the return of the Stark family. You see uh, one of the sons up at the wall. You're going to meet the uh, progenitor of guys like Ned Stark. We're going to see old school Winterfell. Like Even if you were a longtime Game of Thrones head, there's a lot to look forward to in this season. And even if you're not, Stuff's going to get crazy. All right. All right. All right. Connor, uh, real quick, just take us on to our last trailer. We don't have to get too deep into this one because it's just a second trailer. But uh, how did you feel after seeing it? Yeah, it's Furiosa, latest in the uh, Mad Max franchise. It's more of what we saw in the previous trailer. It's Anya Taylor-Joy getting ripped from her home by Chris Hemsworth with a bad nose prosthetic. And honestly, people keep talking about the CG and how it looks. I think it looks great. He's the most distracting part with that fake nose but this still looks incredible the action looks insane uh joy looks awesome with the, with the shaved head look that charlie's had years back um i i think this one is going to steal the conversation this year i wish they didn't make this trailer i'll be honest with you because i love george miller kind of trailers it's just showcases of action and noise and visual spectacle and it's mad max you really don't need that much story to it so I thought this one overdid it a little bit. And and I mean, it makes me wonder Does you know, I hope they have confidence in this like Fury Road because like I, I really love that movie and I'm hoping big things for this one. But I, I feel like this one showed me a little too much and I just wish it had been just more stylistic like the first one. But uh, I get it. You got to market movies and nobody's taking chances. But uh, yeah, I mean, this one has my IMAX money for sure. So it's already done. Anybody else? <laughs> Dead air. Anybody else? Matt, Janelle? I, I, I feel like we've already built like so much excitement for it. Um, obviously, there's more story to this trailer, and I'm okay with it. But, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I'm I'm excited for it, but I've already seen so much of it that it's not the standout this week for me of all these trailers that dropped. All right. That's fair enough. Matt, you have anything to add? Or you just want to co-sign that and get to your thing? No, I mean, I, I, I really dug it. I'm not, I typically like more trailers than less. I'm, I'm just that kind of person, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so you're I don't the mind problem. Seeing, I, yeah, pretty much. I, I think I am in that you're respect because I like is. to see it. I, you know, I take some convincing, right? I, I, I like to see a lot of trailers. They get me, fair get enough, me hyped up. But, uh, but this one, I mean, I'm, I'm hyped. I, I think it, I don't think it necessarily needed it. I just enjoy seeing more of the movie. But I, but I think uh, Taylor Joy is going to kill this one. I, I, I'm hyped oh, for yeah. this. I think it's going to be good. Anya's, Anya's on one right now. And even with the fake news, I I, I want to see Chris Hensworth having fun being bad. Like, I, I think that's going to be – the man's just charismatic. And I think he's – that line, but can you make it epic? Like, that all alone is just already a line. You know what I mean? So I just want to see a him Fast and there. Furious Jason Momoa-style movie from, from him. I need this. Yeah. All, all right. So – we're all, I mean, we're already in. Matt, uh, this is a trailer none of us really saw coming this week and uh, came out of left field. you want to talk about that? Yeah, so uh, Marvel teased uh, a while back, actually, uh, one of their new projects uh, from Skydance. 1943, Rise of Hydra. Uh, it was teased before as this um, very story. Uh, it's from the Amy Hennig, uh, famous for the Uncharted uh, series bias confirm it's one of my favorite franchises right us uh, so, so i i've been very excited to get a game from her because a lot of her projects and stuff have just not come to fruition so uh very excited to get a story driven game here it is set in the year of 1943 obviously it is a younger captain america 
And what's interesting is, especially from this trailer that sticks out, is Black Panther uh, is actually Azuri, which is T'Challa's grandfather. Um, and so Carrie Payton does the voice of Black Panther, and my God, just kills it. Uh, I just, I just, lo- every time he talked, mm-hmm. <laughs> every time he spoke, I was like, yeah, give me this, please. In fact, I, I wasn't as keen on on Cap's voice uh, because you know I will say I've just I've liked other renditions uh, of the character so I'm not sold there but all the other voice acting amongst the other kind of four main characters here um, you're gonna be uh, Gabriel Jones is a U.S. soldier uh, and Anali is a Wakandan spy and then of course it's Cap and Black Panther those are gonna be your four main protagonist uh, characters in this um, but I mean it looks gorgeous it's hard to dissemble like to decipher like w- if there's actual any there doesn't really seem to be any gameplay here it's all there, you know cg none. trailer all... yeah um yeah some of the you know the moving back and forth of like caps uh shield and stuff hopefully gives an indication of what they're going for but you know it's it's kind of hard until you start to see some hud and some gameplay mechanics and see how this is going to actually play but you know hennig has a good resume so <laughs> i'm hoping it, it works out but this is it was really pretty really impressive uh it got a lot of discussion going it's not till 2025 but you know so it's it's a little ways away but not as far as maybe some people thought so uh excited for this any thoughts on this one um, so it, i will it, i will say i just want to say i think there are a couple quick shots of just like establishing shots of like characters running or just like kind of moving around a level i think there's like one or two of those and that's about it yeah I'm not a fan of the way Cap looks in his face because he looks so much like U.S. Agent from Falcon Winter Soldier. He does. And I don't like it. It makes me uncomfortable because I feel like I'm watching him (laughs) instead of Cap. But at the same time, that's why it rustles. So I forgive them. (laughs) Yeah. But uh, no, this looks great. Matt, like you said, (laughs) we need to see some gameplay because think of how hype people were for Suicide Squad Kills the Justice League until we saw gameplay. And we realized, oh, crap, this is live service. I don't know how just got Joker. I don't know how that could happen here. I don't think it will. I think I mean, given who's behind it, that this seems very much targeted at a single player experience. Christ, I hope that is the case. But I kind of have to hold my breath until then. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to be keeping an eye on this 1943. I mean, this is interesting. It's an interesting one to adapt for a game, but we still got a lot of video Marvel and DC games in in the works. So I'll be hyped to see this. And I love that they made Kari Payton look like Kari Payton in in the yes, which is you know if you don't know who that is, um, you know he was uh, Ezekiel on The Walking Dead, and he's like one of the more prominent voice actors. He's cyborg, baby. From yeah, he's cyborg. Teen Titans go, baby. Although, Although somebody did point out when you watch his conversation with Cap. There's a couple of lines where he sounds Jamaican, and now I can't unhear that. Oh, you know, boy. there's there a go. um, there's a Black Panther game being developed by EA right now as well. That's like its own thing, but I'm not gonna lie. I would just can I just get a game featuring that dude? Like I just need this Black Panther in a game. <laughs> that's that's what oh, I man, need. I'm really. I'm, I'm really uh, I'm really hyped. Also, we got the first trailer for Star Wars The Acolyte this week, but uh, we don't have to go too much into that because we did a whole reaction episode. Me, Matt, and Connor hopped on and gave you our reactions to it. So, Janelle, let's just clear the floor for you to give your two cents so we know how you feel. I mean, it looks beautiful and really interesting, but I have no idea what this is about. (laughs) Nobody does. Don't Don't worry about it. I don't know those references. I know everybody's freaking out about the line about, like, not trusting your eyes or something. Like... I, I don't remember that reference. Like I, you know, I I'm going to definitely watch it. It's on Disney plus and it is star Wars, which I've been having a blast with, but it, I don't know if this is like something that deep cut fans are going to love. No, Maybe no. I just don't understand, but either way I'm on board. I'm about it. I just, I legit have no idea what the story is about or, or any idea of what this is based on. That's the okay. You're not yeah. alone. Nobody does. Um, <laughs> the High Republic is something that launched while we were doing this show. And so we've covered it. Like, I've covered a lot of it. Matt's helped me do some of it. Like, But a lot of people in mainstream Star Wars never read the High Republic books or comics and have no idea what it's about. Okay. And it doesn't <laughs> matter because this show is set between that when that line is doing its stories for about mm, 150 years of content 
and the Skywalker saga, which which starts anywhere from 300 to 200 years after the High Republic begins. This is set in the middle. This is set 100 years before the Skywalker wow. saga, which is 100 oh. years after the events of the High Republic that we re are reading in the books and the comics. So nobody, this is unknown space. Nobody knows what this is. So this is kind of a story. And we have no idea what this story is about. Because according to main Star Wars, by the time in episode one, you know, the Phantom Menace, when Darth Maul's running around, everybody doesn't believe Qui-Gon Jinn because they're like, bro, nobody's seen a Sith in a thousand years. As far as the Jedi are concerned, when they destroyed the Sith Empire, which led into the High Republic, because after that, it was a golden age. The Sith were gone. The Jedi and the Republic kind of, you know, flourished together and everything was cool. They say that there was no Sith between the end of that empire and when Palpatine and Maul start popping up in the prequels. So there being a red lightsaber in this trailer is problematic because it's like, wait a minute, that's we've heard there was not supposed to be any in a thousand years. So now what's this mess at the end of the Ooh. High Republic era? And how does it bring down or and it can't fully collapse anything, but how does it start the downward slide that led to Palpatine, you know, bringing the Sith back? So, yeah, it, it's it's going to be interesting to see how they pull that off. I have my own theories. I mean, we do know there are Sith Lords. There's Darth Plagueis. There's, you know, even Palpatine, where he started and decided to become a Sith. Um, how long these people have been alive, what their ages is, you know, how they've extended their life. There's all these questions. There's a young High Republic girl who's in this, who's now older 100 years later, and she's the one with the bald head and the green and stuff like that. So she's aged up. So they're playing... They're basically playing with connecting the High Republic line with the Skywalker saga line in a mainstream direct way. But we don't know how that is. So we'll find out. For deeper thoughts, please go to the Comic Book Nation feed and download our Acolyte Reaction bonus episode. Thank you. That was a great All right. <laughs> so we don't want to get too bogged down because we're getting to the end of the show. But we got to check in with uh, some geek TV. Uh, the one I want to spend the most time on is, of course, Shogun. Episode five. Um, man, this show, I mean, it's going to be hard for me to beat this show as show of the year for, and that's, it's early, but I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to be hard to beat this show for show of the year. Every time this is on, my entire world just falls away. And like for that hour, I am just in the world of Shogun. And, you know, party episodes are always, like we say, you know, a party episode or like a gathering episode is always one that's so tricky to do because there are just so many so much subtext going on between the people who are gathered but man this show did a like a gathering episode with that awkward dinner date that was woof that was just next level um and yeah i think i just wanted to see an entire gift series of fuji sama making faces while other characters are doing stuff um <laughs> which the Shogun team actually reached out to us. I can say that behind the scenes. And that's one of the subjects they want to talk about possibly is the editors. Like this was a part of the show. They purposely wove in was just like the female characters reacting to things in the background, which is its own show in itself. But um, this was a masterful episode and there's so much that happened, but like, I love that the show episodically is not doing what a lot of shows is. It's just like, Oh, we were one long movie and we just cut it up. No, like every episode has a point and like a theme and an arc and by the end of this episode just staring at a rock now is going to make you feel all kinds of ways just staring at a rock and making sure that rock got put back up is like everything right mm -hmm. like and it's just man this shows this shows nuts you, you could have called this episode culture shock just for all the things black thorn goes oh, through here. Act, i see act, what you did there accidentally ac well accidentally killing the old man by a mistranslation he's like you guys were willing to do that over over a pheasant, seriously, and he he's shocked by it. And they push back, and they're like, "No, th this is how we are." But even then, yeah. he, he points out to the husband who, after he abuses uh, Fuji Sama, is just like, "No, sake ain't an excuse, and to hell with cultural norms. You're just a dick." And even Sonata at one point is like, "Yeah, I know we have the whole thing about husbands and wives, but." Even I'm not okay with this. It's like, oh, okay, so Blackthorn actually has a point. And that culminates well, at the end of the episode where it's like, you can't be getting upset about an old man dying. For one, I'm using it as part of a plan that I've got going on. And also, 
people die here. We're surrounded by death. If the earthquakes and tsunamis don't kill you, our culture will. But then he goes and saves them from the landslide. He's like, oh, well, maybe the guy's got a point. And maybe it's not so wrong to actually value life. Well, and he I laughs think... when he hands them the swords, even though culture to, in their culture, that doesn't quite make sense. And he's like, huh, okay. So I feel I like there's that... common ground for them to find. I like that. I think... Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm saying one thing I just want to push back a little bit on is because this is a tweet I had that just keeps gain, gaining <laughs> ground as it goes on in the weeks is about the takes of this and the readings culturally. And one thing I loved about the Shogun book is that the show is even enhancing more is that there is no clear cut cultural perspective. There is no Western perspective. Western white guy perspective is correct right. in this. My favorite line in this is just, and Toranaga is the best character, is when Blackthorn's going on and he's having that breakdown and he wants to like leave. And Toranaga looks at him and just like, and he's going on about the old man. He's just like, stop acting like a child. Like you, in just those simple sets of words, it's just like, yeah, you are in a culture where you don't understand like what you say matters, what you do matters. There's a ritual to all of this, and you're just haphazardly running around, you know, playing kind of like you know, guy from another thing and just acting like your cultural sensibilities are the only ones that matter, but they are not. And that's kind of the point. It's a humbling episode for Blackthorn in this, where he's got to realize, like, you know, he wants to make them out to be barbarians and all that stuff. But like they're just like, no, dude, you just don't understand like what duty is, what what our culture, you know, family, duty, all these things you don't know. And it's interesting to see, you know, how this old man's life, what he thinks it is versus what it is in this larger kind of chess game mm -hmm. that they decided he was like, yo, I'm sick and I'm, this is what I'm going to do because this is a good end for somebody of my status like that's deep stuff to like really consider and, and then how that gets used and how it benefits in, in his life and all that. It's, it just makes you think. And I like that. And there's no one clear cut perspective on people, on culture, on, you know, all of that. It, it just really kind of makes you think, but uh, Matt and Janelle, what'd you guys think? That is amazing. <laughs> the show is just bad. It's, it's so good. I mean, I I keep take Matt. You take this one. I feel like I keep just talking and talking. Matt, oh, Matt's muted. muted. Muted, Matt. There <laughs> it is. All right, I finally did it. I haven't done that this, for yeah, so long. Yeah, I know. You've been, um, it's been a while. Uh, so yeah, no, I. But I think you guys really said it best. I think that's a lot of like we covered a lot of ground there. I, I have nothing really to add other than I've just been really enjoying it. Uh, and I always enjoy, um, uh, cultural conflicts as topics and shows. I think it results in some of the, when handled correctly and with nuance, you know, it, it results in some of the best TV, uh, in a lot of ways. And so I thought, again, I, I love that moment. Um, I think this was handled really well. Um, I'm also very much like, you know, you know, Thorne could use a little humbling <laughs> every so often. So I'm like, okay, when that happens, you know what I mean? Um, but other than that, I, I thought you guys, you know, said it really well. So I'm enjoying it. It was great. I have an interesting take. I, I totally forgot. Um, my in-laws were visiting and they're, you know, in their seventies. And I tried to tell them about the show because uh, like my father-in-law is really into civil war and like historical stuff and, just like he's into all of that stuff. And I tried to tell him about the show and I got them really interested and they were like, oh man, we can't wait to watch this. And then I go, but they're subtitles and you have to read a lot and you have to pay attention. And they just immediately checked out. They were like, oh no, like we're not, this isn't the show for us. And I, I just, I hope that a lot of people aren't too turned off by that. And I don't know if I'm when I'm telling people if I should tell them that those are there or if I should just tell convince them to watch the show and then they can learn they can find out or the because well, you can't make sure you do tell them there's an English dub. Yeah, yeah. you, you yeah. can tell them there's an English dub. Yeah. Right. Make sure but you sell that part. Same. I mean, at the point that people are like, I can't read subtitles, they'll watch an English dub. They'll, they'll yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's it's like when bon when Parasite won the Oscar and Bong Joon Ho goes up and says the half meter barrier of subtitles 
once you get over that, there it opens up a whole world to you. So mm. it just it hurts me when people are like, oh, I, I can't do the show because of subtitles. It's like me too. You're missing out on so much. And the dubbing yeah. just does not do it justice. No. But they won't know the difference. Just tell just be they won't know. They won't know. <laughs> How will they be what are they comparing it to? The thing they don't want to do. All I'm fine. saying is you can't do laundry while watching the show. You can't like cook dinner. You gotta focus. I don't yeah, attention. you shouldn't. No. But you I don't think to. that's like I I don't want to do laundry while doing a show. You know, I mean, I, I don't want content. to either, but oh you know. I do. there's a con I want to be as productive as possible while I watch TV. That is Wrong. exactly who I am. Me too. No, I think there's levels Sorry. of TV. Like, yeah, I'm gonna do things for <laughs> no, a lot during of shows. any this TV. Is the show. Any TV. Are, I I have a podcast wild. going in between when I am walking from one room to the other room. <laughs> I must be doing yeah, something. We're so aligned. and listening to something and doing like laundry or dishes. I that is me. That is yep. who I am as a person. Same. Which, Except not yeah, with this so. show. This is the one show. This and Halo. Yeah. I've actually been sitting down and taking the time yeah, to like wild. watch. Yeah, I just pause this a lot. I just go, oh, I gotta go do that and pause. <laughs> I was like, nah, so I'm not. You, it's not you right. go wild. I got crap There's to do, man. No. Sorry. No. I look at everybody. Bro, I got a lot to do too, but I just take one hour. This is my one restorative nope. hour where I'm like, yo, I'm just gonna wrap myself in a blanket, sit That's down. That's yoga for me. And put this on <laughs> and yeah, I'm getting this in. So y'all are wild, but uh, we gotta get out of here. But uh, let's talk about Halo. We have a whole recap of Halo season finale and a, an interview with showrunner David Weiner that's up on the comic book nation feed in our quick save segment. But um, yeah, hype finale. I'm just hoping I'm pulling for season three. I know Connor oh, wasn't in the boat, to. but I think the three of us were in. I thought this was a great finale compared to especially compared to season one. And yeah, I need that season three blow or blow. blow, blow. It, may, may I defend myself? No, I, I, actually, I mean, I, I, I was supporting your opinion. I didn't wasn't attacking it. I was oh. like, I didn't think they got you, uh, but I I know they got us. But yeah, go for it. But I actually I dug the finale because oh. I think when it comes to when it comes to the Bungie era of Halo, what people forget because it's so overshadowed by the multiplayer experience is that the single player campaign it's mostly sci fi horror, especially when the flood shows up. So I thought, why did episode four with Reach, and why did this episode hit me as hard as it did? It's because it actually dove into those horror elements. With episode four, it's the horror of war as this unstoppable alien force comes in and just wipes out everybody. And with this, it's the flood where, like Janelle said, we're getting Last of Us vibes with this. They honestly held back with how twisted and deformed the flood makes the infected look. And I hope well, they yeah. don't hold this back was on Twitter. Oh, my God. Halo Twitter is the worst. You all are the worst on gaming Twitter. You're the worst. <laughs> I'm sorry. Wow. Absolute <laughs> trash takes. Like gaming Twitter, like oh you guys are trash, God. man. And they sorry, say I'm man. The man. <laughs> it's like it's yeah, all of gaming Twitter. You guys go touch grass. Like people were freaking out because there was a first stage infection. You meet the flood in Halo when they are fully like infected. You gotta, in a TV show, it's okay to show the progression of infection. We see the person who was infected first eventually start spitting out tentacles, and it's like, okay, yeah, yeah. when we get to later infection, guys, there will be some of that horror stuff. Mm -hmm. Touch grass till then. Look at the sky. It'll be okay. <laughs> wow. Listen to our Halo okay. bonus episode for the finale breakdown. Oh, seriously, and, uh... Matt, can you imagine if Kofi knew about wrestling Twitter? My lord. <laughs> I've seen, yeah, I've seen a dip in. Yeah, I've dipped in a couple. None times. of them hold a candle to Star Wars Twitter's. I don't know oh, what no. you're talking about. Oh, good God. Star Wars Twitter's the oh, worst. My Star God. Wars Twitter's awful. Know. Twitch streaming oh. Twitter's pretty crazy as well. That's bad too. This this really <laughs> is just our segment on Twitter. Sucks. <laughs> there are lots of bad. Yeah, there's lots yeah, of bad uh, places on Twitter, <laughs> and you shouldn't go there Black sometimes. So, uh, I got to support Black Twitter. Yes, that keeps me hilarious. That's hilarious. Um. Uh, all right, and Invincible's out still. Uh, we also have an Invincible recap episode with Logan Moore. Um, this is one of those more moving the pieces episodes, but uh, you know, it was pretty solid. So, Invincible's still happening. If you want our full breakdown, check out that on our feed as well. Uh, when we, me and Logan Moore, talk about this latest episode and what this show's doing right, what it might not be doing so right, and where we might be headed next. Uh, anybody have any strong thoughts of Invincible before we get out of here? 
No, but the Doctor Who trailer just dropped 26 minutes ago. Golly, what is going? Why are all these? Why are they all dropping right now? I don't know, man. This week is crazy. I'm so tired. I am so tired this week. I am so (laughs) exhausted. Like, oh my god, I have fallen asleep on my computer multiple days this week, and it's just like just trying to get up a Ghostbusters review right after seeing it at night. Trying to get all these recaps done for podcast and written like every piece of news has dropped this week. Like it's it's been an exhausting week. I'm, I'm getting out of here. We're going to sign up. I'm going to listen. But exhausting. Shout out to the Midnight Boys. I'm going to listen to some Midnight Boys and, and, and chill out for the rest of the for the rest of the weekend. But uh, yeah, man, I'm exotic. Exotic. I see. I can't talk. Exotic. I'm, I'm exotic. Exotic. Kofi, you are. I've said so many questionable things already on this podcast because my brain is mush. Um, I'm exhausted. Uh, oh boy, but I am exotic. If you guys want to chat this about is... the Doctor Who trailer, feel free to tweet me. Yeah, tweet Janelle. Doctor Who tweet, Twitter uh, is not toxic. No, no, there are some good Twitter fandoms. Like, yeah, there's some real positive ones, man. Like, yeah. There's some great ones. Um, you just got to go looking. And these days, oh, those threads can get a little hairy. So be careful. Uh, the guardrails are off. <laughs> so um, You can find me at Kofi Outlaw. <laughs> You can, you, find can find me on YouTube. you can find me on YouTube at Connor J. Casey. You can find me at Janelle Wheeler on everything except for Twitch, where you'll just find me as Janelle. You can find me at, at Matt Aguilar. <laughs> okay, that's, Matt's that's having a breakdown. Best. We're going to get out of here. We are Comic Book Nation. Go on our feeds. We have Anime Initiative, yeah. which is heating up. Shout out to Megan Peters, Evan Valentine, and Nick Valdez from our anime team. They've been killing it on Anime Initiative. Um, also listen to quick save our gaming segment matt pulls comics every week for the pull list where we break down the best in comics the big publishers and the indie guys got a lot of indies coming out biker mice from mars and all kinds of yeah. things. matt aguilar and jim viscardi we let him out of jail for five minutes and it gets nuts check that out if you want to hear what's going on with the mcu including some deeper examinations of x-men 97 head over to the phase zero feed and check that out and if you're looking for pokemon latest head over to a wild pokemon has appeared that feed for all things in the pokemon gaming community all right i'm tired going to rest matt aguilar janelle connor thank you guys again there's so much content go see something read something watch something this weekend we are comic book nation peace later